Hello everybody, hello student, hello professional, hello masters of your own destiny. I hope you guys are doing fantastic. Thank you for being back here with me from Suarez Basement. I really appreciate it. Your company means the world to us. Please, if you don't have done it yet, please remember, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, leave us a comment, whatever that comment is. You can say, Professor Suarez, love your show, you rock, or you can say, Professor Suarez, you suck. You should retire, <laughs> whatever it is. It's okay with me as long as I can hear from you because your support means the world to us. I want to dedicate this show to Black Lives Matter. I think it's extremely important to give voice to those who need to be heard, especially right now in this time in history. So I want to start with one of my favorite poems, which is called Someone Else's Eyes. In the beginning of this poem, he say, if I could see the world through your eyes, I wonder what I would see. Will I see the good and bad? Will I taste the sweet and sad? Will I understand you better if I could see what you see? And that is the whole goal of this video podcast, to try to see the world through the eyes of our guests so we can learn, we can listen, and we can become better allies, and we can bring real change to this horrible situation that at this point have been for way, way, way too long. In that regard, we have great guests. Markel Jeffrey is here. He is the assistant coordinator for the diversity and inclusion for the student programming at SUNY Ospigo. He was my student in some point and he's a terrific individual. And we also have Kyla Bouts, which is the a uh, Black Student Union president, also at SUNY Ospigo, and I think it's going to be an incredible, interesting conversation. So again, guys, thank you for being here, and let's see the world through the eyes of Markel and Kyla. Keep your ears open, keep your mind open, and let's listen and let's learn so we can become better allies. I love you, and I will see you next week for another new episode from Suarez Baseman. Let's start our conversation right away. Here we go. So if I could see through your eyes, the eyes of a young Afro-American woman and a young Afro-American man in this time in history, what I would see. Oh, you could go, Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... For me, right now, it's like a tough time. Um, I have like a younger brother who's growing up and he doesn't really quite understand like what's going on. Um, and then for me, well, as I was growing up, my, one of my uncles is a cop. So I always grew up comfortable around the police and like feeling safe, like when they're around. But now, like now that I'm older, I really see like what's going on. And it really makes me uncomfortable to see what's going on. It makes me sad that a lot of people like don't understand and don't even want to try to like sympathize or like see where we're coming from or what we're going through in America right now. Not even just America, actually across the world. I can say as a black man in America, I feel, I feel a lot of ways. Um, I feel hurt that this is kind of a repetitive uh, thing the theme in, uh, has been like that in history. Um, but I also see the optimism in it. I see as a young black man now, I see although there is this continuous fight that we do have to, you know, continue to uh, go towards and find a resolution to, um, I feel like we have the proper people and that proper push now to uh, more so than ever be proactive. So I feel that optimism in that way. That is, well, that's good news. Optimism is always good. But Kayla, you were saying uh, before that um, one of the things that made you sad is the fact that it's still people out there that doesn't understand. And I think uh, one of the, the goals of this video podcast or the goal of, of these conversations is how can we understand? What do you think we need to do to understand and, and put ourselves in your shoes. It will never will be the same, right? Because I'm not an Afro-American or a lot, but how I can see the world through your eyes, how I can understand. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I could just give would be like to read up on it. Cause I know that there are like a lot of articles, not just on what's going on now, but 
how it has happened throughout history and like the same story repeating. Also, if you have any um, African-American people in your circle or that you talk to, I feel like this is the perfect time to reach out to them, not only to see how they're doing, but for them to inform you about what's going on, how they feel and how it's, how it's gotten either better or worse for them in their opinion throughout the years. Right. Uh, but, but I guess my, my question is, and it's not that you have to have a story or you have to say, oh yeah, I felt discriminated at some point in my life. Okay. Because, or, but Tell me a little bit your personal relation with discrimination because who you are. Have you ever felt or in your family, have you heard stories about this? So I can say that me particular, um, like in Buffalo, New York, uh, me and my friends, we were, we have been stopped a couple of times by police officers um, more than they just a regular stop. Like we had to get out the car. We got frisked. Um, you know, just off of, you know, nothing much off of suspicion from, you know, from the sheriff's side. Um, and just the way that that made me feel, although it's not like extreme, like any other story, I still felt that aggression towards me. Um, you know, I felt that I was a target. Um, and even like kind of going back into high school, I went to a predominantly white uh, high school, Catholic. Um, there wasn't a lot of discrimination, but you can see like towards the teachers, like if me and my group of friends, like me and my black group of friends were like in the hallway, um, like before homeroom, just, you know, chopping it up, uh, catching up from the night before, uh, we would kind of get talked to. But if it was the same for the, you know, my white counterparts and friends, um, it wouldn't seem be an issue. Like the teachers would kind of disregard it, even though we would kind of be at the same type, you know, speaking level volume, you know, just joking around. Uh, we were always the ones that were uh, talked to about and confronted. So that's a part of uh, my kind of history of discrimination. Mm -hmm. But it's still, and that's the thing that discrimination, um, I, in my opinion, it, it is, is, is not small or it's not large. It's, it's discrimination. It doesn't matter if it's something as, as small as you think it is, you still have a conscious mind that, you are being treated different because the color of your skin. Definitely. Definitely. Kyla? Um, one of my cousins when I was younger. Um, so my great grandmother in Harlem owns a brownstone. And it's like a brownstone is like a built-in tax. And um, the cops had a warrant. It was looking for somebody who um, was dark-skinned, had a hoodie, and was tall. That's the only description that they had. And my cousin fit that description. But he was sitting, he was sitting on the steps waiting for my great grandmother to get home. So... The cops saw him and automatically assumed that's him. Um, so they beat him up. Um, what's it called? Police brutality. They um, beat him up. They broke his jaw because wow. he had a black eye and I think something with his arm. Um, and he was just trying to tell him the whole time, like, this is my great grandmother's building. Like, I'm not trespassing. I'm waiting for her to come. Um, and he didn't believe, they did not believe him at all. They, when he got to the police station, they didn't let him call anybody for a whole day. So all of us was like calling, looking for him. Like, we don't know what happened to him. Um, and then when we finally got a hold of him, um, they were just like, oh, I, they didn't say that he was standing and like he was trespassing. They said something else. I don't remember what they said, but um, yeah. Um, I was about like 11 years old when this happened. So back then my parents didn't really, like I didn't really get all the stories about like discrimination and everything yet. Like my parents were trying their best to like hide it from me. But when that happened, um, that was a time for like my whole family, especially the younger generation, to have that conversation about um, racism and police brutality and discrimination. Hey, hey, Markel, do your family have to have that conversation with you? Like, like I, I think it is, is, it seems that this is a conversation that it happened in, into uh, the Afro-American families where in some point it's almost like, we need to sit you down to make you understand that this can happen to you because who you are. Do you have that conversation at home? So personally, I've never had that conversation um, like with my parents or anything, but I've seen it like a uh, direct impact like through my, like my dad. Um, but with the lack of that conversation um, and kind of like having to educate myself and, you know, see through other people's lenses and through my own experiences, um, it's encouraged me to have those conversations with, my younger siblings and like my younger cousins and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, especially at a younger age, you know, kind of 
bringing it to their level, depending on where they are, like a teenager or a kid, but letting them know that your skin color may be a, an offense towards you. Um, it may, you know, it may put you in situations that you may not understand. Um, but just be prepared for that and, uh, you know, take the proper precautions. Uh, you know, don't argue, comply, um, make sure you're doing everything. Uh, have all proper identification, make sure you don't have anything illegal on you. So those type of things. Mm. And and uh, of course, we also have seen the horrific video of the day of George Floyd, um, which it break my heart. It does just, is not justified. How, how that made you feel, guys, when you watch that video? Um... um. You go ahead, Kayla. I, I didn't watch the whole, I didn't really watch the video. Like I, I refuse to watch it. I only like keep seeing the picture mm -hmm. um, with his knee on his like neck. That's all I keep seeing. I don't want to watch the video. Um, I was going to watch it one day and when I went on social media, I was like, you know, it's going to be in my timeline. So let me just, you know, wait for it to pop up. Mm -hmm. I saw somebody like quoting what he said in the video. And after that, I was like, I can't watch it. It makes me so sad. My, my worry is always that this happened before. Do you guys think as a young generation, has, has young Afro-American in this country, that this time will be different? That do, do you think that could be the case? And if this is the case, that it would be different. What do you think are those changes that we need to accomplish? Um, I know so far, um, different places in america have made a few changes new york personally i know the only change that cuomo is um presenting a i don't know if it's called a bill but he's presenting something saying that um calls against like a racial call saying that this person attacked me and they're not that's gonna be illegal mm -hmm. um that's the only change i know has happened in new york but i know like la they've um cut police funding by 130 million dollars and they're gonna put that money back into like smaller communities and communities with that's predominantly black. Um, Minneapolis, they were talking about abolishing their police force. I know some people, well, a lot of people like through social media, they've been saying that that's what they want. But I feel like um, those are good changes, but I also think that we need more like deeper changes. I don't wanna say deep because it was like deep. Um, I also think that we should, I also want them to like teach more black history in schools like growing up because the only thing you really learn growing up is about Martin Luther King, um, Malcolm X, and I tell you Malcolm X was doing too much, that he was too violent, you don't need to do that. Um, and you don't really, they don't really go in depth about, um, I don't really know her name, the first person to go into schools. Like you hear about it, but you don't know all the details in it. So I think that one thing that we should change, well, that they we should fight to change is um, teaching black history in schools. These conversations are actually very healthy and very good. I'm so glad that we we're having this conversation. I'm so glad people is out there protesting because if these things are not happening and we keep quiet, nothing happened. We don't have change. So closing with a positive aspect, I know, Markel, you are a really good rapper that I have a, uh, heard your music before. So you want to share some kind of message with us and we close with you giving us uh, that? Yeah, okay. So this is, uh, I guess, my little message. Um, it's on this, you know, on the, on the note of, um, you know, what's everything that's going on. So I say, my Papa Joe taught me all the things that make a man. Malcolm X taught me all the ways to take a stand. Suarez encouraged to let my brain expand. That's why I'm my worst critic and my greatest fan. You see, we the new age of revolutionaries. What we trying to do, build a better future clearly. We protesting cause this fight never ended. It's feeling like the new civil rights that we live in. If you sell a little white, you get life in the prison. But if your skin white, that's all right, you got privilege. But when your skin black, you gotta fight to be in it. That's okay though, I'm on the front line. The defense is tension, is getting real. They lynching my people still, sending us on the field. Killing this man is ill, that's why these players they nail. Can't picture it how we feel. But did you see that image of Emmett Till, huh? I be dressed in all black with my fist high. My time's now when I swear to my wrist watch. My shift stop when I make it to the tip top. I can't keep my lips locked. This is real hip hop. 
Not sick.